while the U.S. is currently in the midst of its longest economic expansion in history, for many Americans, the math does not add up. As the gap between the haves and have-nots grew last year to its highest level in more than 50 years, fixing inequality is one of the main pillars of several presidential candidates. That includes Colorado Senator Michael Bennett, who joins us now along with Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. Senator, it's good to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, very simply, we've watched, if you look, there are five income quintiles. The top two, they've seen their incomes go up. The bottom three stagnant to right. fall. You have a plan which does what? So if I had to summarize the last 10 years of my town halls, it's very easy to do it. People coming saying, we're working really hard. We can't afford housing, health care, higher education, and early childhood education. In other words, we can't afford a middle class life. My plan does a bunch of things, but among them, it massively increases the child tax credit. And, and the result of that would be to reduce childhood poverty in America by 40 percent and two dollar a day poverty for kids in this country for three percent of the cost of Medicare for all, which is why we should be focused on my plan, not on Bernie and Elizabeth's plan. A massive increase in the earned income tax credit to make work pay again in this country, paid family leave and raising the minimum wage. There are other things we need to do on housing and on higher ed, but that's the core of an approach to try to say, look, we need to give people some breathing room so they can actually have some cash flow, so they can make purchases, so they can drive economic growth. It's not just economic growth really for the top 10 percent, who are the folks that have really gained in the last 50 years. And second, we got to invest in our economy again. You know, since 2001, we have borrowed $5 trillion from the Chinese for the privilege of giving the wealthy people in America tax cuts. That's a joke. We borrowed $5.6 trillion from the Chinese to fight these wars in the Middle East for the last 20 years. From the vantage point of the people I represent in Colorado and across the country who are struggling with an economy that doesn't work for them, we might as well have lit that money on fire. And they want to see us investing in this country again, building infrastructure in America again, investing in R&D in our country, and investing in our education system so that our kids actually have a fighting chance in the 21st century. That's what we should be focused on. So for your plan, is it still that we're going to borrow money for the Chinese? We're just going to use it for better purposes? Or if you well, found a different... Well, I, I, I will say this. I am, I am completely uh, uninterested in being lectured to by the people that have put this country into the uh, fiscal condition that it has been. There's one person in the Senate that got an award last year for fiscal responsibility, and that was me. And, uh, and it's because I voted against that irresponsible tax bill, and I voted against the spending bills. Um, so we're going to have to raise some revenue. You know, I think we should take the the top rate back to where it was before Trump uh, cut cut you know said he was having a middle class tax cut when it was really going to the wealthiest people. We ought to equalize capital gains with ordinary income. We ought to attach it. Uh, Tax. Would you remove the Social Security cap? I would, yep. And we got to tax inherited wealth in this country. We're not doing that anymore. Well, what about by the, the way, that's not driving anybody's income up in America. What about the wealth tax that uh, Bernie and Elizabeth, as you call them, uh, want to I, impose on multimillionaires? Yeah, I think it's unworkable and probably unconstitutional and unnecessary. What I just told you could raise the revenue that we need to pay for the things that I was describing earlier. Um, I also think, you know, a carbon tax at some point would be an efficient way of dealing with the, uh, the climate issues that we're confronting. But, you know, today, just to the point, we're collecting 16 percent of our GDP in revenue and we're spending more than 22 percent. Um, that's disgraceful. We've got $22 trillion of debt on the balance sheet going to $30 trillion. We're at, you just mentioned that we're at, you know, the, the longest economic expansion that we've had uh, in 50 years, but we've got the biggest economic inequality that we've had in 50 years, which is a lot more important to most people that I'm, that I'm representing. Uh, and you've got a president who's so irresponsible that even at a moment of that kind of economic growth, he's driving the deficit up. Nobody is more responsible for more debt on the balance sheet than Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump. It's incredible. You said you would roll back the tax cut for the wealthiest. Even if not instituting a new wealth tax, you would roll it back. Would you roll back the corporate tax cuts as not well? To, I wouldn't take it back to where it was, but I could see taking it back to 24, 25, which is where the deal was supposed to be struck before Donald Trump and his allies 
to, you know, wanted to give people one more Christmas present at the end of their tax bill that healthcare. they rushed through in the middle of the night, by the healthcare way. Healthcare is a big part of this, uh, and when you ask voters what do they care most about, healthcare is often at the top of the list. So you favor, you do not favor Medicare for all. Why don't you tell us briefly what's wrong with that, and your plan is a public option for some people, not right. for everybody. What's wrong with Medicare for all? I mean, it's, I wish we had three hours to have that conversation, but the bottom line... It adds up to three hours. Uh, it, mm -hmm. as, a, as a Democrat, you know, and as an American who used to work for you know kids living in poverty and kids in in the Denver public schools Medicare for all does nothing for them and certainly a losing fight on Medicare for all for the next 10 years does nothing for them only 30 percent of Democrats support Medicare for all 85 percent of people in America are covered today let's give everybody not give everybody make available to everybody a public option they can buy if they want to keep their private insurance keep their private insurance if they want a public option administered by Medicare let them do that auto enroll the people that are eligible for Medicaid and the and the kid insurance program S chip into that and you're done with coverage oh, you still have a huge cost problem that's not being oh. debated or negotiated at all and we saw Elizabeth Warren by the way pull back a little bit to the center on her Medicare fraud but I am curious you said just a few minutes ago you would remove the Social Security cap now you are I believe one of the sponsors of the Secure Act are you not in the in the Senate the, the retirement bill that is making its way but not being voted upon uh, I'm not sure I'm, I'm sorry well, not this, to know the name of it but. well let me get to this point if you remove the cap on insurance there are people in metro areas like San Francisco Los Angeles Chicago New York who make 125 130 150 thousand dollars removing that Social Security cap that hits those people and it doesn't solve the retirement problem for them so what do you offer them well, I think that whatever proposals that I make, when you add it all together, are going to be far more progressive than what we're facing today. And I'll, I'll look at that in the context of the higher price places where people are living in New York and San Francisco. I'd be interested in that. But I, but I still think we need to lift the cab for Social Security to make it solvent. You were not in the most recent presidential debate. Did you watch? I did. Was there any single moment when you wanted to leap through the screen and get up there and say, no, you're wrong, here's a better idea? Basically for the entire hour and a half. <laughs> you know, I mean, we have to well, be... Well, what bugs you the most? What bugs me the most is that we're not focused on an agenda that will actually unify the Democratic Party and win back some of the nine million people who voted for twice for Barack Obama and once for Donald Trump. And that is staring at us in plain sight. The tax policies that I talked about earlier are broad, broadly popular with the American people. Investing in our infrastructure, investing in education, getting you know sidetracked on this you know Bernie's ideological commitment to and Elizabeth's ideological commitment to Medicare for all isn't going to make a difference for the kids that I used to work for in the Denver Public Schools, and that's how I evaluate our work. By the way, having Donald Trump as president uh, is also going to be uh, really unfortunate for the kids that I used to work for and, and for America's place in the world. He's the weakest foreign policy president we've had in my lifetime by far, and he's costing this country a great deal there as well. Well, Joe Biden is also up there. I mean, do you like what he says? I think that it's time for a new generation of leadership. I think that's really important. He also says that uh, if we just get Trump out of the way, it'll all go back to normal. I totally disagree with that. Our democratic institutions are broken. They've been smashed by a combination of partisan gerrymandering, Citizens United, and uh, the immobilization of our exercise in self-government by the Freedom Caucus, which, by the way, has nothing to do with conventional Republican you know, ideology. It's a, just a destructive, self-destruct, such a destructive ideology that they're willing to repeat Putin's talking points. And we got to overcome this era in our politics and get back to a place where we can actually govern the country again. The other thing I'd say about this is that if you if you are somebody who believes that we have to do something about climate change, for example, just to take that as a good example, um, you can't accept the rubble that is Washington, D.C. today. You can't accept a world where I put my ideas for, in for two years, the other side rips them out. I put them in for two years, the other side rips them out. You can't solve climate change two years in a row, which means somehow we have to develop an American climate policy like we once had an American foreign policy where presidents knew what their job was, whether they were Republicans or Democrats, vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union or the Cold War or, or, or the Atlantic Alliance. And we are so far from that today, and I'm not sure Joe Biden sees that. Senator, you, you could argue that a lot of these policies that you're talking about, a lot of the changes you could make, 
it, you could do in your current job, or at least you can make progress toward that in your current job. So I'm curious, you know, the field is large. Why, why are you sticking with Well, I don't point? think we are making very much progress on any of what I just talked about. I think we're going backwards on every single dimension. But if there was a Democrat in the White House and people like you in the Senate, do you feel like that you could make that well, progress? Well, I, I, I would hope so. I would hope so. Uh, I think I'm the only person in this field that's actually won two national races in a purple state. Nobody else has done it who's running. You know, I've got experience in business. I have experience. Mayor Pete and I both started at the local level. The only difference is my school district had a budget that was three times the size of his city. And I've been in the Senate for 10 years, which is long enough to know why the most important things aren't getting done. So I don't think anybody in this field is bringing the same uh, set of experiences to the race that I am. And I think I am in a better position than anybody in this field to beat Donald Trump. I believe it, which is why I've stayed in the race, even though I, I haven't been on the debate stage and I haven't polled as well as I wish that I had. We're adding people in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to work hard in Iowa, and I think we're going to see positive results. Michael Bennett's in it to win it. He is the senator from Colorado as well as a presidential Thank candidate. Thank you for having me. We appreciate me. your being here. Thanks. Thank you.